right, welcome back to Oki Magazine YouTube channel. I'm here with two of the great legends of jazz, uh, Mr. Tim Warfield and Mr. Terrell Stafford. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I know. We, I know. Uh, Jonathan did a piece on Tim last year, but then I was like, now we got the the YouTube thing happening with the channel. I was like, rather than write all this stuff out, it'd be easier just to to chat with you all. Yeah. So y'all just, uh, well, at least uh, Tim's done with the semester at at uh, Temple for the most part. And then, um, Terrell, you'll be done soon. So congratulations on that. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. But I just wanted to, to chat with y'all. Y'all are legends of not only jazz, but more specifically, I guess, um, of the city of Philly. Um, and I wanted to maybe just give uh, the, the audience out there a little bit of history and everything. So when did you all first meet up? Like, when's the first time you all met? Um, I think it was early nineties, right, Tim? It was, I think it was earlier, T. Was it? I, I know I started, it was probably 89, 1988 or 89. 88, exactly. I, I, I actually figured that this would be the first question. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, actually, I, I, I sat down and thought about it. I was like, okay, I, I recorded Jazz Futures in 1991. That means I did Marlon Jordan in 1990. And you and I, I remember that you like, Terrell and I got our our, our quote unquote discoveries, big gigs. Mm -hmm. Was it like a week apart or something crazy like that? It was a he, week he apart. Went, he went with Bobby Watson and I went with Marlon Jordan. And we had been playing for about a year before wow. that, maybe a year and a half, right? Yep. Wow. Okay. So he's right. It's about 88, 89. Okay, gotcha. And um, actually, now I'm thinking about it. I'll you all had associations with D.C. Did you all meet in Philly or did you all meet in D.C.? Um, we actually met in D.C. Yeah. Actually, actually, before we met, I went to hear Tim, but I was, you know, I wasn't the, uh, the jazz person at the time. So I just sat in the back of the club with my date. And uh, after he played, I left and said, man, that dude can play. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. man. I wasn't the uh, best person at the time either. I was just trying my best to learn how to play with all of those guys. He tells me this. I don't remember. I mean, a lot of that is kind of blurry because uh -huh. I'm old now. <laughs> Four great times, but he he's 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 consistent because he told me we may have met in passing during that time. Oh yeah, mm. you got it. Uh, do you uh, do you remember the name of the club or venue in in DC where where y'all met? Absolutely. Yes, it's called Les Nieces, and the reason I remember there was two, uh, like fences or what, whatever, like on the bandstand, uh -huh. <laughs> and, and, the, and then the horn player stood in between these two fences. It was the oddest looking; it looked like a patio almost. But <laughs> uh -huh. yeah, great yeah, music. Yeah, that's right. They had those little like they gate? were little fences, like a little gate. It was weird. Yeah. That's right. They were metal. Yeah. And they oh, block the bandstand, but yeah, less nieces. It's technically les nieces, but if you said that in DC, you'd never find out where, <laughs> where the place was. If you did that, I can guarantee you, they'd be like, "What? Where?" Be like less nieces. Oh, <laughs> yeah, man, less nieces. <laughs> oh man, oh man. So, so this was about uh, eighty-eight or nine, eighty-eight or eighty-nine. You said. Yeah. I, I, was it was that in that time frame too? Or was that had to be earlier, right? Had to be early. That had to be no. You know, I think I heard you. My last year of college, uh, undergrad was like eighty eight. I graduated in eighty eight, and I heard you right before I graduated. Okay. Okay. Oh man, I guess uh, that may, maybe that'll segue into the my next question. Uh, this is more directed toward Terrell. Um, uh, so you started out as classical trumpet, but then um, I heard that you were you were the story is you were sneaking out to go down to D.C. Uh, to play down there, right? Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, I, to, the the situation that um, made me do that one that my trumpet teacher at Rutgers when I was working on my master's was just like, you know, if I ever hear you play jazz, I'll drop you as a student. And I'm and I you know I was like, why? You know, you taught Winton and you taught Brent, I mean uh, Terrence. Well, you know, why can't I play jazz? He goes, because I want you to have a career in classical music, you know. Um, and so basically I went to D.C. so that he would never find out. And then Kenny Barron would sneak lessons in with me and told me, he said, you know, if you're going to play jazz, man, you got to you, you can't do it in a practice room. 
And so I call this guy, Paul Carr, that I knew from D.C. And I said, hey, if you know of any jam sessions opening up, let me know. And he says, oh. well, matter of fact, in a month, I'm going to start a jam session. It was a club called Tacoma Station. And if you want to play, you can come sleep on my couch. You know, I'll pay you a, you know, peasant's rate and you can, <laughs> and you can come <laughs> play in this club. <laughs> oh, man. It's actually, I think I might have, I think I'm friends with them on Facebook. Is that club still around? Is, is it still around Tacoma? I think so. Yeah. Yeah. It is. It is. Oh, okay. Yeah. I'm glad to hear that they're still going because I, I know I was at, um, uh, Bohemian Caverns closed down, so I was I was sad to hear about that. So hopefully we don't lose any more any more clubs on the scene. But I, I never I never been to Tacoma, so I, hopefully the next time I get down to DC, I'll be able to check it out. Oh man, so that was a what was that like a two two hour three hour commute from from Rutgers down there? Yeah, but I had you know my my father worked for Amtrak, so uh -huh. uh, up until I was twenty five, I could ride the train for free, so it was easy. <laughs> I hopped in the train. I had a free pass. I go, you know, stay with Paul Carr and play the play the club, and that's kind of how Tim and I met. Because Paul, he couldn't do one of the nights, mm -hmm. uh, so he asked Tim to sub, and I was like, "Oh, I remember Tim." Well, and so Tim came in, and uh, the rest is history. You know. Oh man! I was uh, and Tim. Were you going to Howard at that point? Were you at Howard? Oh man, I was working in a, a warehouse. For a five and dime, it paid really good. I was working third shift. Uh huh. And uh, um, I think I, I had hoped, if I remember correctly, I had hoped to go to um, plug in another school, but <laughs> I had hoped to go to Berkeley, uh -huh. specifically because Billy Pierce, mm -hmm. uh, the tenor player who I saw with the Messengers, was there. And I really wanted to study with him. I was transcribing a lot of his solos with the messengers mm -hmm. and I had met him once and had a chance to play with him. Though he was very tall and intimidating. He was very kind to me. And gotcha. so I'm not sure he even knew, I think I may have written to him once, but I was planning to actually go there, like apply and go there. So I was saving money. Mm -hmm. um, but in the interim, a lot of great things happened. And, uh, I met Terrell, and then right after that, I got a gig. Like, I got called for a real gig, mm -hmm. and uh, I never looked back. Gotcha. I, I, not yeah. too often. <laughs> so, so you all met in D.C., and then uh, did you all kind of migrate up to uh, come to Philly at the same time, or was it like uh, like different timing as far as coming back to Philly? Um, well, Tim came to Philly. Mm -hmm. uh, when I met Tim after we played at, uh, at Tacoma Station together, mm -hmm. I was like, I told him, I said, man, I'm so embarrassed. I sound so sad because I was so sad. People wouldn't even call me Terrell. They called me Haydn because it sounded like I was playing the Haydn trumpet concerto. So they're like, oh, here comes, here comes Haydn. And so when I played with Tim, it was like it, he was on fire. So I was like, man, anything you could do to help me, I'd appreciate it. He's like, man, all you got to do is come over to my crib, man. My pop's got all kind of records. We could practice, we could do this, we could transcribe, we can do all this stuff. And I was like, really? He goes, yeah, man, just come over to the crib. So on the weekends, almost every weekend, you know, I do my my classical studies during the week. And then I go to Tim's on the um, on the weekend and, and we practice, hang out, mm -hmm. you know, eat, you know, <laughs> it, was, it was like, it was the best time ever. I mean, we were like totally saturated in the music and then one day he's like hey man let's just learn these three songs together and we'll just start going to jam sessions and watch he goes we'll start to work we'll start to work and i you know i'm doubting thomas i'm like no nah, come on man three songs and we'll work he's like trust me that's that what that's been his motto for for 40 years <laughs> trust me you know <laughs> trust me i like it i like it yeah. Yeah. Like, don't do this. And I was like, really? Trust me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I can hear him saying it, too. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, but I have to say for the record, Terrell Stafford has been telling this one part of the story for, for a minute. When I heard Terrell, Terrell, Terrell was an amazing player. In my opinion, he might not think that, uh, and, but it doesn't really matter what he thinks. It matters what I think. And I know, <laughs> and, and no matter what anybody else else thinks, 
he was always an amazing player. And I, I really admired his level of discipline mm -hmm. and his level of execution, execution on the instrument. It made me think about playing the saxophone very differently. I've had a lot of trumpet talks from his learnings while he was in school. He just come back and share the information. And I tried to figure out a way to apply it to 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 my to my instrument mm -hmm. but we were we were we were pretty in sync from the downbeat of the first time we played together it was very clear to both of us by the end of the first song that something special was happening mm -hmm. and that we should we should remain connected and and we what what i find interesting about it in retrospect is how quickly we move we, we moved on it Mm -hmm. And and without telling secrets, we both at that time in our lives had certain obstacles <laughs> we were trying to get around. We, we we talked about pretty much what they were, and we had decisions like we do we, like the decisions we had to make, and we we made a decision to kind of get together and practice. Mm -hmm. And 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 we had a, a a stint, a long enough stint in Central Pennsylvania, uh, but a short enough stint for not to be years worth before we, we, we had an opportunity to, to go off and do other things. Gotcha. Gotcha. Oh you know, man. A larger scale. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I guess I kind of want to go back to those, those jam session days. Um, cause I was just talking with Pete Souders last week. Uh, can you maybe talk about, um, uh, the, the jam session? I'm sure Orgley's was one of them for sure. Right. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think we had a pass. I think we we we, we had a good pass uh -huh. uh, because I, I I ended up going to Ortlieb's. As Terrell said, I went down first, but he was not people who he wasn't long after. That's just the way. Either he went somewhere, and then I'm not long after. He went, I went somewhere, and he was not long after. Uh -huh. uh, um, um, and I went down, and and all of my situation in Philly was the result of happenstance. It, it, the only part that was planned was the going down to sit in at a jam session. Uh -huh. And that was based on a dare from my pop. He dared me to do it. And, oh, gotcha. Yeah, and he's, I don't know why, I'm glad he hasn't dared me to jump off a cliff. Because <laughs> I always take on his dare. So I went down uh -huh. and um, um, I played with Pete Souders. He was running the session. Uh -huh. And there were a lot of people at this jam session. Mm -hmm. And it was, I mean, not just musicians, though, a lot of listeners, like intent listeners mm -hmm. who, you, who it was, uh, you could tell it was very clear that they were used to intently listening, but not afraid to be a part of the moment. Mm -hmm. So it was very natural. It felt very natural musically to play for people who clearly under, understood what the music was mm -hmm. and, and responded to it. In, in, a, in, a, in a very uh, 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 visceral manner. So um, I played, I did okay. I asked, for a, I asked for a potential gig and Pete was really clear that um, his allegiance was to the Philadelphia musicians, which how can you not respect that, right? For someone, for a club owner to even say something, he was a special guy or is, he's still alive, very special guy. <laughs> <laughs> and 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 to make a long story short, as I was leaving, he stopped me, and he said, "Hey, you just never know." And so let me get your number. So we exchanged numbers. Make a long story short, less than two weeks later, I get a call uh, to play at Ortlieb's to do a to do a gig. I was subbing. Bootsy Barnes had double booked the late great Bootsy Barnes. God rest his soul. Double booked. Mm -hmm. And so I was subbing for him and I knew about him, uh, but I didn't, I, I hadn't really heard him yet. And so I went in and when I went through the door, I, I opened the door and stopped. I could hear music, but there were people. <laughs> Literally when you open the door, there were people at the door. And so I'm trying to get through. I didn't know where to go. There was no dressing room. I have my case. And then I found Pete and he said, go into my office. Mm -hmm. So I was cramped in there. And then when I came out, I realized, oh, my God, it's Shirley Scott. <laughs> <I'm> oh, <doing yeah. laughs> Why am I here? <laughs> I'm doing this thing with Shirley Scott. And it was Mr. Roker and Arthur Harper, you know. Uh -huh. 
And oh, that's okay. how it started. But not long after that, I was like, well, if you like me, you got to hear my boy. Mm -hmm. He can really oh. play. And uh, I, I, I know Terrell had reservations about it. There's all the documentation where he's even stated he had reservations about it. Uh, he did not want, he, he was, did, and this is one of the few times I ever defied what he's asked. Because I try to respect people's wishes, mm -hmm. but I got him up there. <laughs> and he blew, he blew, he blew the roof off the club. Just blew it off, man. And that's when, like for both of us. Uh-huh. We just, we, it was, it was, I, I'm, I'm speaking for both of us, but hopefully not pretentiously. We knew at that particular point we were in school. Gotcha. We, we were in school. It was a learning, it was learning from that point on. <laughs> um, oh, and, man. And, and that included the sessions. That included the sessions. Like mm -hmm. not just playing with Shirley, but the sessions, the Philadelphia experience, mm -hmm. you're in school. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's funny. I mean, even when I came there back back in 2007, I felt the same way because I had, you know, done the, the classical thing in school and then I got over there. And I think I met probably you at, at Lowe's Hotel, uh, Tim. That was the mm -hmm. first time I met you. And then I was like, oh, man. So this, now, now, I, now, now I heard. I remember I found you on MySpace. And I just, uh, before I moved to Philly, I was researching everyone. And I was like, I was like, oh, there he is. <laughs> you know, so now it's, it's interesting to see how it, the legacy seems to continue. But, um, I think I probably definitely got a different experience of Orly because I got it after the, the new ownership, after Pete had sold it. So it was a little different for me. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, man. Well, what, what memories do you have of, of Orly Leaves Tarot? I know, I know uh, Tim talked about the origins. Like, but, but maybe you can maybe expand upon it like after you all got the, the start with, with Shirley or like playing with Shirley and everything. Yeah, you know, I, I mean, I was, you know, very reluctant to go with Tim. But he was like, don't worry about it, man. You know, you don't have to play if you don't want to play. Don't worry about it. I'm like, okay, good, because I don't want to play. And lo and behold, he gets up on stage. And Shirley's like, I want to invite this young man, Terrell Stafford, to come up. I was like, Tim, no. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, here's the thing. Like, you know, it was when Tim says it was school, it was more school for me than it was for him. Because Tim, you know, he's always had a his – upper trajectory has always been here and mine has always kind of been here. And Shirley, like Shirley always used to say to me, I don't, every time Tim would play, she would start giggling. And then she'd lean over and she goes, that boy has been here before. That boy has been here before. And then when I play, after I play, she goes, baby, keep working. Keep working, baby. Keep working. <laughs> <laughs> so so you know, I think that the beauty, the beauty, of, of or leaves was a, you know, going to the sessions, watching Shirley run a session was beautiful because, you know, she taught people etiquette. You know, she was, she was a gentle, um, a gentle spirit. But if, if, if you decided to do something that she didn't agree with, she would let you know in, in the sweetest way possible. But it, but it, it, what it did, it prepared a generation to respect each other on, on and off the bandstand. That's what I found to be really incredible. And then like Tim said, like, you know, the sessions itself, I mean, if you didn't even play, listening to the level of musicians that came up on that stage from New York, from Philly, was just astounding. So, you know, it was it was it was a great, great learning experience. But, you know, um, I, I'll never forget the, the, the uh, again, Tim said to me, um, you know, they're, they're going to have auditions for, for the Cosby show. We should do it. And I said. The co we can't make that. He goes, Shirley's the musical director. We should do it. I said, Tim, now look, I went through my whole spiel and we did it and we got it. And that was incredible. Not only were we doing the show with her, but we were traveling with her. It was just like an incredible experience. And then, you know, for me as a trumpet player to hear like Swana, you know, come down and play, you know, you know, that was astounding because he just i mean he, he was he reminded me of tim like they both came out of the womb you know singing parker solos or clifford brown solos you know so when it's time <laughs> to play it was a regurgitation of, of of what they knew and hearing that man it was so inspiring and and then I, you know what can you say i mean bootsy from bootsy to jimmy oliver i love i used to ask jimmy oliver you know because he'd always say can somebody give me a ride home and i'd be like i'll give you a ride home you know, I always give him a ride home and just talk to him and pick his pick his mind. You know, man, what what an incredible mind he had. Even though he was a quiet dude, 
But man, his, his thoughts, he was always, you know, so progressive for, for someone of, of his age. It was just a very inspiring time. Yeah, I remember talking with, with George Burden at one point. He said um, back in the 90s or maybe even early 2000s, some people said that the, the, scene in, uh, that's the, scene, the scene in Philly was actually better than New York. Would you all agree to that or would you say it was different or was it what you feel is better? I think it was more communal. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah, it was definitely a stronger sense, maybe because the city was smaller. Maybe it's just the nature of how, uh, if, you, if you look up historically, See, here's, I think here's an important thing to understand about New York, which is very different from a lot of places. You have some of the greatest, if not uh, along with the greatest in New York City, hands down. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think the important thing to understand about New York is that most of the people that have had opportunities to play in New York, not everyone, but most of the people were invited there. Mm -hmm. That's a different sort of development and a much more individual development the moment you get there. Because then you're like, okay, I'm up here in this energy. Where's my place? Whereas in Philadelphia, it was family and community that you can see amongst generation upon, upon amongst generations. And that worked in conjunction with what I would consider to be a pretty complete idea in music, generally speaking, being offered uh, um, uh, to uh, people to, to listen. I mean, from avant-garde, we can talk about Sun Ra, mm -hmm. if we want to talk about the fringe, all, of course, to what people, I guess, would consider to be more traditionalists, like um, um, Shirley Scott or Mickey Roker, who I'm um, I'm not sure if it's still the case, but he was probably, a, I know he was at one point the most recorded drummer. I think mm -hmm. it might be Bernard Purdy now, maybe. But he was the most recorded drummer uh, on uh, out of a uh, jazz drummer on, on jazz recordings. And then you had all of the music in between as well. Mm -hmm. You know, so, so I, it's, it was a different sort of a synergy that they had. And one thing... Uh, and I'm, I'm taking from Terrell's verbiage on this because it's, it's something that as we talk more and gotten older, I, f I find to be really important in this music. Uh, um, as an, I find it to be an important essence is there's always been tons of joy <laughs> at all of these endeavors. Tons of joy. Oh, most definitely. I mean, uh, I think the first time I heard you all play together, I was like, oh, okay, I, now I see it. Because I've heard people talk about it. Because, I mean, me, me just moving to Philly, I remember just hearing about these these uh, these anecdotes and everything. And then I was like, oh, okay. Matter of fact, I think I, I had went up to, to Hero Ter Terrell's group at the Vanguard. That might have been one of my first trips up to New York. Um, I was checking you all out there, yeah. I remember that I got a pizza at the pizza spot right next to it, too. Man. <laughs> I forget the name of that pizza spot, but it was really good. <laughs> It's called mediocre. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, yeah, well, you know, yeah. I mean, uh, I'm kidding. It probably is. I mean, back then, I mean, my first time being in New York, I was I was slurped it down. <laughs> yeah. Oh man. But uh, I, I guess I'll skip to the. I mean, um, I'll skip to the next the next part um of, of my my question. At least my curiosity. Um. When was like uh, so you you all started playing together you know quite extensively. Um, when did you all start forming your own bands and uh, what was the, the genesis of, of that relationship? Because uh, you know even though you know you had your own bands, you, you opted to play with each other still. And, and but then like you would come out come in and out of playing with each other and so on and so forth. So maybe you all can talk about that 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 part of the the, the history. I'll leave that to Tara. Well, you know I think you know. I think our history was dependent upon the opportunities that came, you know, like Tim was going out with Marlon and I'll never forget this. So Tim got the gig with Marlon and he's like, Terrell, man, I'm, I'm playing this club with, with, uh, with this trumpet player. So, you know, I was like, trumpet player, what about me? You know, so I go down and I'm like, not only play with a trumpet player, but we look alike, you know, <laughs> <laughs> and, but, but here's the thing that I'd never heard. And here's the difference. I think that, that between Tim and I is like, you know, when he played with Marlon, it was like a, a set of tunes, uh, a way of playing, you know, with Troy and those guys that I never really experienced, you know, outside of Tim and I doing 
especially like younger musicians play on such a high level. And so mm -hmm. Tim was around like these younger musicians playing on really. And then when I got the gig with Bobby, uh, you know, with Bobby and Victor, they were younger at the time, but it was just a different mentality that they had, you know? Um, and so it was, it was a different experience playing with them. So I, when I did my first record, um, it was called Time to Let Go. And Tim was traveling, you know, he was Jazz Futures and without Marlon, he was out. I don't know if it was McBride by then. It could have been some McBride by then, but okay. probably maybe I think it could have been some McBride by then as well. Right. So yeah. like he was super busy and I, my first record was, was a quartet record, you know, and then um, as things unfolded and as we started to, you know, have gaps in our schedule that coincided, that's when I think we started to come together, you know, because uh, that's just how it worked out. It wasn't, you know, I always knew if I had a band, Tim would be the person to play in the band. But for the time that he was busy, I got to experience other people because he was busy, like, you know, Dick Oates or Steve Wilson um, playing with the two of them and playing with them in different configurations. You know, Steve with Bruce's, Bruce Sparks' group and then Dick Oates, you know, in the Vanguard Jazz Orchestra or in the Carnegie Hall Jazz Band. So, you know, those experiences, that's the kind of, vibe that I had and Tim had a totally different experience with you know all the upcoming young folks making like this incredibly sophisticated but energetic music that that um and burnout was really popular I mean I, I didn't know what burnout was Tim was like I was like what the heck are y'all doing you know because I, I that I'm, I'm playing standards but they're burning out on such a high level so that was a whole that was a, that was just we were coming from these two different worlds and when we came together, I, I think we influenced each other's from, from our experiences. Very which led to us putting together bands and making music and, and Yeah, because I mean uh, I always think of you like uh, you as like one of the, the, the two greatest dynamic duels, kinda of like Kobe and Shaq in basketball. It's like <laughs> You know, so I, I had to throw my Lakers analogy in there because I'm a Lakers fan, but you know, <laughs> <laughs> you know, but y'all, the Sixers might do it. Y'all, y'all getting up there little by little. It's getting better. <laughs> oh man, uh, Tim, you want to add anything to that or anything? Anything you remember? Yeah, I, I think Terrell covered a lot of it. Uh, it's funny sometimes you don't even realize things or how things are working until you look at them in retrospect. Uh -huh. and, and, and I agree that a lot of it had to do with opportunity mm -hmm. as well as experience, man, because you're, you're, you're being pulled in a lot of different ways. And mm -hmm. I, I, I do think he made it an, an, uh, uh, um, an interesting uh, point. Um, my name was definitely more affiliated with the Young Lions, mm -hmm. but Terrell was definitely considered a Young Lion. But he was very much more considered like a New York cat, and he had that he 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 had that validation the result of having an opportunity to perform with so many bona fides consistently. You know what I mean? So so I um uh I I noticed that immediately, and within the I, opportunities that we that we were given when we had space or situations that allowed us to call each other, uh, we called each other, you know, and continued to work. And it was great because you could hear, you literally could hear some of the musical experience that, that we, of which we had partaken in, in, in the endeavors what we, that we were in at the moment together. We're like, oh, wow, oh, this is new. Because we, so, we were so familiar with each other's playing. So you could hear like these changes. That was really great. But I do think a lot of it really had to do with opportunity. Gotcha, gotcha, yeah. So, like, when you came back after playing, it was like, oh, this is something new. And it just kind of helped your own um, relationship evolve even more with the music and stuff that you were playing. Mm -hmm. Oh, man. That's amazing. I mean, it's, it's nice. So, so 88, 90. I'll, I'll put the fingers off camera while I count the, the, the <laughs> it's been a minute. It's been a minute. It's yeah, been a minute. <laughs> oh man! So you all you've had, I mean, such a great career um, playing, you know, with different people, and then obviously together. And now you all are together at at, at Temple, right? Uh, teaching alongside. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, um, more accurately, Gerald Stafford is the director <laughs> of the program. Uh -huh. I am. A, I am a co-worker and understudy slash employee. <laughs> Let's get it right. I want to get it right. 
<laughs> we are not side by side in any event. <laughs> oh, <man. laughs> no, I'm there. Whatever he needs, I try my best. Oh Always. man, I mean, it's such a great program. Maybe, maybe, uh, uh, maybe I'll direct this to to the director, to to, to Terrell. <laughs> uh, but um, yeah, can you maybe tell tell us a little bit about the the I guess the program you got set up over there. Because I mean, the the players that come out of there are, are just you know high caliber. So obviously, you're doing something correct over there. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, director, leader. That's all. That's all a, a smoke and mirrors to me. And I'll I'll tell you why I said that because. My dad is, you know, he's, he's a military guy, but he's always been like the head of a company, you know, vice president or president of a company. And he told me when I was younger, he says, you know, if, if you want to become a, a, a leader in your household or outside of your household, the best thing to do is always invite people to be part of your vision. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and, and if you do, you know, I, and I look at like my, qu- my quintet, only thing that I do in my quintet as a leader is, is announce, you know, I'll ask people for, to, to bring in music. I'll ask people, I mean, Tim knows, Hey Tim, what do you think of this set? Help me. Can you help me put this together? What do you think of this? Can you give, can, what do you think? You know, I ask everybody for input so that it's a collective, you know, um, it's a collective mind frame that people have. And I want everyone to feel invested. And I think temples the same way, you know, uh, when I started there in, in 1996, it was really dismal. The person that got me the gig was Shirley Scott um, because she and I taught at Cheney University together. She got me to teach there for four years. And then when the position came at Temple, she's like, you got to take this position. And I was like, why? You know, I'm here with you at, at Cheney and like we're, we're doing all this stuff together. She goes, yeah, but I teach at Temple too. And this is like the third, you know, search for this position. And if they fail this search, then the jazz program will be abolished at Temple. So she goes, you got to do this. And she goes, they're looking for someone who does classical and jazz. And, you, you know, you got to do this. So I did it, you know, and I had her support. And uh, and he, the interesting thing was that I got there my first day there uh, after I got the gig. It was the most depressing time ever for me because I walked into a rehearsal and it was a big band rehearsal. And there were like five or six people in the rehearsal, which maybe one or two were majors. So I'm thinking to myself, like, what did I set myself up? I set myself up for failure here because I'm stepping into a program that didn't even have a, a big band. I think there were two combos at the time. Oh, wow. And, and uh, it, was, it was disheartening for a minute, you know, teaching these classes. I mean, I had to teach everything. I taught improv. I taught both levels of improv. I did a history class. I had to teach everything um, when I started there, and uh, it, it wasn't it wasn't a pretty thing. And I didn't have that much teaching experience, so I'm calling Jimmy Heath and I'm calling David Baker to kind of guide me through the mind frame and mindset to build a program. And then the the, the greatest thing that happened was um, the director that was of the program went to uh, the dean and said, "Well, you know, Terrell travels quite a bit." And um, I think he only needs to travel two weeks a semester. And anything outside of that, um, I think you should limit. And the dean said, <clears throat> he called me in. He goes, well, the person in charge of the program only wants you to travel two weeks a semester. So I said, thank you very much for this opportunity. Um, you'll, you can expect my letter of resignation by the end of the week. I said, um, I think this program could be has the potential to be really great, but the short sightedness is, is why I'm going to leave. And then he, he stopped and he says, okay, well, can you write out your goals and vision for the program, how you would see it? And I said, sure. So I wrote it out. I turned it into him. And within like a day, he was like, okay, um, the person that's director of the program now, we're going to make him dean of students and I'm going to have you be director. And I'm going to give you five years to fulfill this vision that you wrote out. And in those five years, I, you know, everything I've written, I've written down all the faculty that I hire. I've written down a masterclass series, a concert series, blah, 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 guest artists. And he supported, the dean supported everything financially, which was a, a true gift. <clears throat> and I was able to get Tim. I was able to get Bruce. I was able to get Dick Oates. I was able to get all these incredible musicians, but really, really incredible pedagogues to come in and guide these students. And in time, the program went from having, you know, 15 students to now it has 125 students in the program. 
Wow. Tim, Tim is the coordinator of the graduate program. Uh, you know, they pushed me at the beginning to have a graduate program when I became director. And I said, no, because graduate programs need to come after undergraduates established because the undergraduate actually feeds the program. The graduate program is the icing on the cake. So then once it got established, we got the graduate program um, in, in, you know, in place. Mm-hmm. And, and it's been a, uh, it's been great. You know, we went from half a big band. We have five, five, six big bands now and almost wow. 25 combos. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's a group effort. You know, it's a we did a record a few years ago, a faculty record called Family Feeling. Mm-hmm. And that's really indicative to me of what the feeling is at Temple, regardless of my position, you know. Yeah. <clears throat> so and this year was a really powerful year because of COVID. And we, we did a lot in person this year. But the coolest thing was that I wore a mask and most times most people didn't know who I was. So it was just that, you know, it was just, just it was, I got to see the program. I got to see it from a different lens, you know, oh, um, man. Okay. I got to attend like all the recitals. I got to attend all the juries, you know, I got to see everything. Normally I'd be on the road. So this year was a very special year. There was a silver lining in being home. I, I mean, I got to get to see the result of Tim's teaching and, and the rapport that he has with the students. I got to see it now because I'm home to witness it and to see it. And it's important. That's what really has made Temple what it is, you know, the rapport and the community feeling. Oh, most definitely, man. I mean, um, I, I was remember me going to, uh, to Philly again back when I first moved there, hearing some of the students out of there. I was like, oh, man, this is this is amazing, you know. Um, and I guess the other thing that I think is keeping the the, the scene really going down there is um is uh, the Philadelphia Jazz Orchestra, right? Is that the is that the, the official title of it that you that you started? Yeah, Jazz Orchestra Philadelphia. Oh, okay, gotcha. I, I wanted it to be the other one, but there's a band in Princeton that took that name already. Oh, so. <laughs> <laughs> oh okay. Oh, man. How, how's that going? Have you, have you all been keeping busy with that project as well? Um, yeah, up until, up until COVID, you know, right. the, the tricky thing is that, um, it's hard getting a big band together, you know, during these times with all the, it's, uh, you know, it was expensive before to run a big band, but now with COVID it's three times the cost because of all the protocols that have oh. to be in place with plexiglass. And so we've done, we've done two or three concerts, something like that mm-hmm. since COVID, you know, but, um, I'm looking forward, you know, we're going to be doing the Nutcracker again, coming up. This year, we'll probably do a tribute to Charlie Parker. We're definitely going to do a tribute to McCoy Tyner, mm-hmm. uh, have some guests in, and just um, just come back, you know, swinging and having fun. Nice, nice, nice. Oh, man, that, that, that's great to hear. I mean, you know, I haven't had a chance to go to Philly since before the pandemic, so I'm mission to get down there and get my, my cheese steak and then see you all, hopefully. <laughs> Oh man, uh, I just got maybe a, uh, two more quick questions. I don't want to keep you all all day, but um, um, either one of you can answer this. Uh, is there anything you all have uh, outside of the temple and, and maybe the big band that uh, you have coming up? Maybe as far as you all maybe doing another recording or like a uh, small group stuff that maybe happening. Tim, um, <laughs> yeah, well, man, I, I, I told Terrell the other day. I made a decision that I, I, I mean, I'm, I, I'm doing. S- some endeavors, mm-hmm. but it almost has to be an offer that I can't refuse. I'm, I'm, I'm blessed to have a, a job, and I've always said that. Um, I've said often, if only I had an opportunity to sit down and if I had a year to write, if I had a year to just practice, if only I had a year. And <laughs> the Lord has said. <laughs> Thy wish is my command. <laughs> so, try, try, trying to make a good situation out of what has been perceived for many legitimate reasons as a bad situation. Uh-huh. I've, I've made it kind of to, to, to focus on on education and, and just the development of musical self. Uh-huh. Uh, with and that includes things like I've, I've I've sat down and written out the design of my new website. I just haven't had it done yet but i've already talked to someone about doing it mm-hmm. and uh um uh I'm, I'm very interested i'll say this quietly uh because i have to figure out when and how it's going to happen but i'd like it to happen this year i'd like to do a couple of uh what i've called interim material which is just some videos i'm not sure if it's going to be a whole concert if i might just gather 
my partners together and say, look, I got enough money to pay you for one song. <laughs> Let's make this a, 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 a very slick endeavor and put it out and see what we can come up with. But that's where my, my head is now. I'm, 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 it's not that I'm not open to playing, but I'm, I'm, I'm very aware of a lot of contradictory information in, my, okay. in terms of what's being, the information that's being shared with the general public. Yeah, and my, my, my intuition tells me whenever there's contradi contradictory information, particularly so close together, mm -hmm. uh, like, you know, like within the same day, <laughs> that, that, <laughs> that, that, that means that uh, one, uh, unless there's a need for you n not to do so, should err on the side of caution. So Gosh, I hear you. <laughs> that, that's where I am. But I've, I've already planned out, get ready, Terrell. I've already planned out my next two recordings. I've written them, I've written them, I've had most of the music is done. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, or and or arrangements so it's just an, an issue of practice so i now have something to practice towards understanding that i was practicing towards something within a, a much shorter interval before i got this thing that, that i got to learn for next week or two weeks now i'm like practice towards this thing for next year and hopefully make them grand so that's my, my my long roundabout answer to saying not much <laughs> 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 How about you, Terrell? Anything, anything coming down the pipeline? Well, you know, um, through these few years of, of the jazz orchestra and the concerts and some of the music that was written for it, mm -hmm. by not only by some of the members in the group, but just by some of our guests, mm -hmm. um, that's been the goal to record it. I would have, I've always loved, wanted to record a, a, a big band record. I mean, I've, I've played on a good enough of them, but I always wanted to do, you know, one that represented Philadelphia. You know, the whole purpose and the mission of what the Jazz Orchestra is about and honor some of the folks that that, that have, have, have made this music so special to me, i.e. Shirley Scott, i.e. Jimmy Heath, you know, um, and many, many more, you know, um, Mickey Roker. And, uh, one thing I have to say really quickly uh, before I talk about future endeavors, but I think this is some I, I've been thinking about this all day today, knowing that we would speak. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Tim had said Mickey Roker was one of the most recorded um, drummers. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the thing that, that I'm just in awe about is that us being around Mickey Roker and talking to him and hanging out with him, you would never know he was the most recorded drummer ever because he was just he was just so incredible a human being. We used to yeah. go eat breakfast together and talk, you know, and and. Uh, it was just, it was the relationship there, you know, even with Arthur Harper, you mm -hmm. know, you know, the relationship, Arthur and I would drive around, I would pick him up and we would go play nursing homes duo together because, you know, I, I would tell him, man, I wish I could do this. He goes, well, let's do it together, you know, and, and these, these, like Shirley, I mean, they, we, Tim and I got to play with heroes, you know, we got to play with like, I mean, I felt uncomfortable when you said legends. I don't feel like a legend. I don't feel like I've done enough to become a legend. Mm -hmm. um, but when I look at Shirley and I look at Mickey and, and, and Jimmy Heath, like, oh, my Lord, that's legend material, you know. All also, they've done for the, yeah, <laughs> all they've done for the music and for education, all three yeah. of them. Mm -hmm. Four. Mm -hmm. oh, so yeah. that's, that's what led me to do this big band record. Um, the reason why JOP is together because of Jimmy Heath. Jimmy, he said, you better keep this group together. You better you better play the Harlem Nutcracker every year at Christmas. Play the Harlem Nutcracker. And I said, okay. And he goes, and then record this music that you have written, that this band records. Record it regularly. Because mm. big bands out of Philly need to be recorded and represented. So mm. I'm trying to keep my promise to him through the music. Oh, that's, that's amazing. Now, that's a good point. Uh, yeah, I mean. Yeah, that, that, so much coming out of Philly. And I, I feel, I mean, for whatever little bit of my career has been going so thus far, you know, I, I owe a lot to the city, you know, you know, to you all cats and, you know, the scene that I, that I, that I was there to experience for a little bit, you know, so thank you all, you know. <laughs> so, um, before we go, I, I couldn't end this interview without asking this last question. And it is, who started the fashion between you all two? I will answer that. <laughs> so when I met Tim Warfield, 
back in the 80s when we were practicing together. Tim made a comment. He goes, yeah, we're going to learn these three tunes. Mm-hmm. And we're going to go out and we're going to play. And Tim was always clean, mm-hmm. always tapping in. And he looked at me and he goes, yeah, we're going to go out and play, but um, those polyester pants are not going to really work. Um, do you have a blazer? I said, no, I don't have a blazer. He goes, okay, I can't help you with the pants. So we'll go do some shopping. So we went, I got some pants and then he had like a slew of blazers and he goes, yeah, I think this would be good. And so he hooked me up with a shirt, you know, uh, I bought a shirt. I bought some, some slacks. He had some killing blazers. Uh And I don't know if pocket squares are in, but if they weren't in, Tim created that. (laughs) You know, <laughs> <and the chair. laughs> I didn't even know what a pocket square was. I was like the difference between a pocket square and a handkerchief. And, you know, Tim had all these folds. So that's where the fashion ca- came from. Okay. And then I'd watch, I'd watch him and, and, you know, Walmart was good to me. <laughs> <laughs> that was, that was, that's what, that what Terrell Stafford just gave you there is a fib. <laughs> Walmart, right. <laughs> oh man! <laughs> oh man! Uh, matter of fact, I, I didn't know anything about the pocket and handkerchiefs or any of that stuff too. So I saw Tim. So <laughs> it, 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 it just, the 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 the, the teaching still going. <laughs> <laughs> uh, do you, uh, Tim? Do your students walk around the hallways with it too, or no? Students, students, yeah. they they get clean. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They get clean. We, I've, I've seen some guys heading, to, and they've definitely gone into transition. I see it out, even outside of the school. I see yeah. cats, the saxophone. I think the saxophone. A lot of the saxophonists from Philadelphia, they're holding it down, and they, they have their own vibe about how to present their fashion. But clearly, they're they're they're, they're style conscious, uh-huh. which I think is important because I know, I mean, it's part of the jazz tradition for sure. Mm-hmm. It's definitely. Uh, uh, part of the saxophone tradition, and it's definitely part of the Philadelphia tradition because a lot of the information that I, that I've gotten was from my my father, who had very very interesting stories. Uh, some of which I did not believe, by the way, because uh, they just sound so far fetched. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, that ended up being confirmed by Bootsy Bart. Like one of the like for for example, my dad used to tell me he said, you know, we we use the term thug. Thuggish now. Mm-hmm. There wasn't an idea like that where you had street cats, you know, would hang out on the corner. And my dad used to tell me how cats would, it might be street, but when it came time to dress up, they would be clean. He said, but you'd hang, you see guys hanging up on the streets and they'd be, they would have, they would be sharing quotes from Socrates. And that mm-hmm. was one of those things I was like, yeah, okay. <laughs> guys on the street corner with little books sharing quotes from Socrates. Yeah, that sounds wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and and one day I'm just talking to Bootsy and I don't even know how we got on the subject, but he shared that same thing. I was like, that's what my father told me, you know? And then I realized Philly has a thing. Mm-hmm. And so even when it came to dressing for all of those people who were from, I guess, that era, like one of the things I used to always hear about is, I don't, I still don't think I own one, is, is having like a mohair suit. At one point, it was really slick to, every, to have a mohair suit. You know what I mean? So, so it's it's definitely, uh, uh, again, I think Philadelphia has a really strong, in-depth culture. If not in totality, it's very close to totality. Gotcha, gotcha. That's where it comes. A lot of it comes from, anyway. Hmm. Yeah. No. I mean, I try to hold it up down here, up here in New York, or I mean, I'm I'm in Jersey now, but I mean, yeah. So, but. And no one to see me right now, so I don't have to worry about it. I can drag <laughs> it if I want. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 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 Well, the when it does come, you know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh That's man. Good. Well, man, gentlemen, thank you for for your time. Uh, again, we have the great Turtle Stafford and uh, Tim Warfield, trumpet and saxophone, respectively. Um, yeah, we got to do it again. I, I was talking with, with Pete, so maybe well, I'm gonna have another. Uh, Another Philly type of uh, interview, and, and maybe get everyone on it and do a nice call. <laughs> so, man, thank you very, thank you again. This is Oki Magazine YouTube with two of the greatest jazz heroes. I won't use legends. I don't want to make make you uncomfortable. So, I'll say two of the greatest jazz heroes: Terrell Stafford and Tim Warfield. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you appreciate it, everyone.